most women start a business? Is it passion, money, or freedom? Welcome to Female Founders, the podcast that takes you behind the scene with women who are founders and CEOs to help you start and scale a successful business of your own. I am your host, Nagelia de Ravine. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Female Founders. In today's episode, I have the pleasure of speaking with Susan Mahaffey, Susan is a strategy human resource executive and former chief people officer. With an impressive background in both public and private multinational companies, her passion for making an impact on people's lives led her to launch the people advisory firm, People Rise LLC. Let's explore Susan's journey and discuss her dedication to helping leaders. Good morning, Susan. Thank you for joining me today. So can you share with us your journey and how you become a strategic human resource executive and chief people officer? Absolutely. Well, it's a long story. I'll try to make it short. Um, So my journey started about 22 years ago when I got a summer job working in HR. And I, I talk about this story often because it was kind of humble beginnings. I got a you know, part-time job. And I was learning how to file and learning different things about what goes on in HR. And I didn't expect that was going to turn into my career, but I really learned that I enjoyed talking to people, solving their questions and their problems. So fast forward, um, I decided during college, you know, that this was also what I wanted to do. So I was working full-time while going to university. And that's what I had experience in from my summer you know, in high school. So that's what I did to earn money and go to college at the same time. And so by the time I got done with my graduate degree, I was already certified in HR and had a full on career. And um, it was exciting. But one of the things that I didn't anticipate was that I had been working in HR for a good while and had a really great run and worked for some small and large companies, family-owned businesses, public, private. I've done a lot of different roles and worked in a lot of different industries. And I think that's something that I really am proud of because, you know, there's different types of work and people everywhere. And then last year, um, the opportunity came about for me to start my own business. And I thought, you know, this is the time. I had been encouraged in the past, but never felt it was it was the time. So I decided to make the leap and then started my business. Um, you know, actually started all the work to incorporate it in November. And then in January, actually like went live with, hey, we are open. We're taking on clients and business um, then. And so from that point on, I have been working as a consultant, working for traditionally small and medium sized businesses. And I'm really focused on providing strategic HR consultancy. So I am looking to understand about where you are in your business. What are your pain points? How are your people and processes working? And then I'm also doing some very specific um, project work, I'll call it, which is anything from trying to secure you a HR leader or trying to help you with some inefficient processes or, hey, I'm trying to get my business ready for expansion. And I am also looking to, um, whether it's expand my business, maybe sell part of my share of the business. I have really been working with um, business owners to really kind of understand where they are at that point in their journey. Where does their people aspect come in and how can I help them since I have quite a bit of experience, not just working in HR, but understanding how, understanding how businesses run. And obviously when you get to that point in your career where you've led others and teams, this is where I think that excitement comes in where you can take all your experiences and put it together and help other, other companies. So now, but I'm very curious. Do, yeah, long and short of it. Yeah, yeah, it did. But also, but I'm very curious because you said that um, something happened for you to say, okay, I'm going to start my business, right? So what was that thing that said to push you to say, hey, this is it. This is the time for me to do that. Because it's, it's come up before, but you never make that decision. Yeah, good point. So I have been with um, a company for nine years and you know, best role I had had, um, you know, in many ways, I worked for Mars Incorporated. And I had, you know, some of the best years of my life, but also I I would joke that it was like dog years, because the amount of change, the amount of things that we accomplished in one year felt like so much longer. 
And so I had a great run. Um, I learned tremendous things, worked internationally in a global role. And then it was time for me to do something different. I did join another company for a short period of time. But as many other people have experienced recently, uh, businesses after the pandemic or during the pandemic had a lot of other changes. And so the organization I ended up joining also was impacted by um, a number of factors. And so it kind of made for a situation where we needed to reduce costs, we needed to relook at how we were structured. And so that was something that impacted, you know, our people operations and how we did business there. So that was something where I said, you know what, I understand that that's now the switch and the change for me too. Um, you know, we have to lessen the people on our leadership team. And so you know, when that happened, you know, I looked at that as an opportunity for, you know, a bigger, you know, kind of bigger purpose, you know, because when you work for companies, you know, one of the things that's different is that you, everything you give, you are providing to the organization. And that worked for me for a number of years. I felt very involved and I treated those businesses like my own. And that was also something I realized I would do really well as, you know, by having it myself. So. Um, that kind of just was the, the groundwork for, you know, maybe it's time, maybe this is, maybe this is what's kind of leading me toward, um, creating my own, own vision and my own kind of future. That's right. But also that, uh, you have 20 plus years of experience. So which comp every company you work with must have some sort of different, um, something different you learn from them, some sort of different skills or different certificate or different things that you have to do. So now are you using all of this type of skills to build your own? Is that what you are doing? Yeah. So as I mentioned before, one of the things that I have taken away from all of the different organizations I've worked for is that, well, number one, I've made some great relationships along the way, people I still talk to. Um, you know, including my boss from my early days at Office Depot, who, you know, still to this day encourages me and just, I really credit with catapulting my career. You know, when you, when you have people who also lead you, sponsor you and show you the way, you never forget that. So one of the things that I have been taking away from some of those experiences is being a leader like that myself, encouraging leaders in the future, and then also taking the varied experiences from I've done a lot of um, work with companies with large hourly populations, where whether it's been in manufacturing, I worked in the waste industry, I have worked obviously for um, a steel company. So when you are working Ooh. with those companies, you are also one minute giving a high level presentation, you might be prepping something for the board or for the president or trying to sell an, you know, a big initiative. But on the other hand, something I really love is to be able to also spend time with the people. So I like to be understanding, you know, what's the temperature? What's it like? How are things going? You know, what are, you know, if you are relatable and approachable, people will, will give you answers and they will relax and they will tell you things. And so I think that allowed me to have a really good pulse on the business. And so I'm trying to take all of that experience, marry it with, you know, again, as you mentioned, I've done a lot of different certifications and things like that. But um, when you've worked for different companies, you learn their business, you learn what makes them successful and not so successful. And then I've also done a lot of work with family owned businesses, large and small. And yeah. so a lot of times with those, I've got a lot of family dynamics. And, you know, I usually am the person trying to, you know, see all sides and see how we can come together with common purpose. So Every job I've had has lended itself to, you know, identifying a new skill and, you know, learning a little bit more about myself as well. But, you know, I love the name. People Rye. Why did you choose that name? Oh, it's a great question. So I'm a huge Maya Angelou fan. And as you know, one of her most popular um, pieces of poetry is in Still I Rise. And in the last couple of years, personally, um, you know, I've had some, you know, things happen in my life that were unexpected. And, you know, like air, I was still rising, you know, even when you've had difficult situations, and I have had some of those, you know, we had the pandemic. Um, yes, I was unexpectedly divorced, like, 
sometimes when those things happen, you really recognize what kind of resiliency you have. And so half of it was around, you know, no matter what, I always find a way to get better or to look to the future or look forward. And in addition to that, I also am seeking clients who want the same. So the ideal client for me is going to be someone who wants to be better, who wants to rise up, who wants to do and look forward to the future and be better. Because when you know better, you can be better. And so that was the concept of People Rise. (laughs) I love it. So now what's the mission behind the company? What do you guys stand for? So I think a few things. I think, number one, we stand for openness and transparency, integrity. I think that one of the other things you'll find with us is that I like to say we're actually the HR people you want to talk to. So um, and what I mean by that is even today, one of the greatest uh, things I can I can try to put into words that I can explain is that people I've worked with in the past will still call me for advice. Or they'll say, hey, Susan, you know, um, this happened. What do, you, what do you think about it? Because this is how I'm feeling. And one of the things I've realized is that people, they remember how you, of course, how you made them feel, but then they remember the impact that they had, you know, at that time. And so I think what we stand for is essentially trying to show people that HR is more than just hiring and firing, that we are a resource of, of good ideas. Um, that we can help you take something where you might be stuck and help you think of it, of it differently. And we really want to make sure people are at the center. So it's, you know, I don't usually use the word HR as much, but it's what people know. So it kind of, you know, HR yeah. is, is commonly used, but people are at the center. And when people are at the center, everybody does well. And so I think that's also what I'm trying to make sure people see is that for more than just HR consultants, we're really focused on your people will make your business, you know, infinitely better if you are focused on them. And that's what we try to help other companies do. But now do you also provide the traditional, normal HR? People always think that's all it's about. For, like you just said, um, hiring, firing, um, things like that. Do you also provide that type of service? Yeah, so at People Rise, we also offer something we call HR concierge. And the concept of that mm. is, you have questions, we have answers. And so I have clients that will call and say, hey, I've had this you know, associate, this employee, this is the problem or situation. I either don't know how to handle it or I've had no luck you know, getting them to change or you know, something else has kind of come up. And so what we help do is help you think through the situation. And we may also, um, one of the things I like to do is usually mock it. So I'll say, I'm going to be the employee now and you're going to be the manager. You're going to be you. Let's kind of talk it out how it might sound. And so we'll give you everything from, you know, that kind of scenario where you're having a difficult conversation to you might be asking me basic questions about um, wage laws and things like that. Employee handbook is big. People ask about that. We help with those areas, um, but we like to do it in service of also, um, you know, a longer term relationship. So we usually like to do something called an organizational health check. Um, and so that's what I'm doing a lot of right now with my clients. So now you also, you call yourself a uh, chief people officer. Is that some sort of service that you provide to your client? Like you become the chief people officer for the company or? Yeah. So on a fractional basis, I can also act as your chief people officer. So For some organizations, they have gone through either periods of either having their CPO leave or they're a business that believes they might need that presence for a business transaction or, you know, some other purpose. And I'm able to provide that since I've been in that role in the past and can help you lead your organizational function. Um, Primarily, what I'm also doing is stabilizing your function in that situation. I'm assessing it and I'm providing recommendations. And for one of my recent clients, I actually filled a role for a vice president of HR, um, you know, where we also help support what does your next leader look like? And we'll help you find that person as well. Because, mm. you know, you need to have somebody on a daily basis. We can help um, in the short term, but longer term, we also want to make sure that you've got the right structure to endure over time. So pretty much you can also do the hiring process for them. Do you, do you take that over 100%? Yes, 
No, we only do the hiring process for HR leaders. So we will okay. only work on um, HR level roles. I haven't been asked to do any others. We may get involved at times in um, being part of the process in the fractional role. So let's just say if you're looking to hire another important leader on your leadership team and you want might want an HR presence because you don't have it today, which happens often because we all know the cost of a, you know, of a bad hire. You know, mm -hmm. if you hire someone and they're not a fit or it doesn't work out or uh, a lot of times what I've noticed is people with the best of intention, they just don't ask the right questions in the interview process. We can help you with putting that process together to make sure you offer, you know, not only a better candidate experience, but you really understand what that candidate has done and talk through their experiences and understand their learning agility. But let me ask you this. Let's say that I'm having, uh, I'm interviewing a, the next, um, let me say, CPA that's going to be taking over some part of the company. Let's say that. And I don't really need you to be present during the interview, but I would love your guidance on what type of questions I should be asking that person. So is that something you can help with? If, the, if you know the profile, for example, you have the LinkedIn of that person, you have the resume, uh, bio, et cetera. Is that things that you can guide the organization to do? Absolutely. So we definitely guide organizations when they have questions around whether it's you know, you have an open position, it's critical. Maybe you you might be stuck sometimes. Sometimes we see the right profile on paper, but then when we get them in front of us, you know, sometimes they all seem the same, you know, as far as, well, they all have the same background, but I'm not sure how to distinguish whether or not they're going to be a good fit for my business. And so that's when I like to incorporate, you know, structured behavioral interview questions where you're asking candidates the same questions, but you're looking to understand their experience. What have they done? What was the situation? What were they tasked with doing? How did they lead the team or what work did they complete? And so we can help you kind of think through and ask you powerful questions around, hey, well, what about this? Or how about if they were to be in this position? How would you see them mm -hmm. uh, perform? Or if you haven't met with them or are having another conversation, we'll also help you come up again with those powerful questions so that when you get into the interview, you can really go deeper than the surface. Because when you ask the basic questions that are on people's resume, you only get so far. You want to go and double click and be a couple layers down. So now um, you're also an executive uh, coach, right? You also, do, you also provide executive yeah. coaching. Is that a service within the company itself you are offering right now? Or? Yes. So um, it's kind of in the work. So some of the coaching that I have been focused on so far has really been focused around HR leaders and also women who are aspiring into leadership roles. So I'm particularly passionate about getting more women into leadership roles. We know that there are not as many women there, are, you know, we're getting better in some cases, but the pandemic yeah. also put us backwards when we saw over 1 million women um, leave the workforce. And so um, a lot of the work that I do do in my coaching so far, especially with HR um, leaders, are around how to have executive presence. They're around how to prepare your conversations in advance, how to do stakeholder management. And then some of the other executive coaching is usually around using some of our 360 assessment work. So I have a partnership with the Center for Creative Leadership, and I'm able to facilitate 360 benchmark assessments, including ones for executives. And so what we try to do is really understand, you know, what's the feedback that you're getting from those raters, whether they're direct reports, your boss, your peers, external stakeholders, internal stakeholders. And how is that forming your brand? And what does that look like? And what are the things that you want to uncover or go um, you know, further exploring? And so um, those are all journeys. And those are, those are things that really take a lot of really good self-awareness and partnership, but it's something that I really enjoy doing. And I'm also starting a um, beta program with BetterUp um, and Ooh. I'm excited to be part of that as well. So yeah, so looking forward to seeing what a partnership with them um, and being part of their network looks like in the future, too. So your, uh, your coaching, is it one-in-one -one or is it a group coaching? 
Um, typically it's been one-on-one, -on -one, but also I'm looking into offering it in coaching settings where there's multiple, so one to many or one to a few. Um, and what I'm finding with early HR people um, is that those that are interested either in pursuing a career in HR, making a career switch or are very new or departments of one, one of the things that they that they benefit from is having others around them that they can also feel like they're not alone. Number one. Number two, they feel like they can, you know, be in a safe place. And, you know, psychological safety is key. And the third thing is that, you know, I can maximize kind of the reach time and cost by having multiple oh, yeah. at the same time. So that's something, yeah, so it's something that I think we're going to see a lot more pick up over time, especially as we come out of the summer and people are really looking at, okay, what have I accomplished this year so far and where am I headed and what do I want to do? I think a lot of people have been struggling with fatigue and are yes. looking to kind of see you know, where are they in their career and where do they want to focus in the future? But may I ask you, why do you look to partner with other organizations? Like, for example, you partner with um, a Center for Creative Leadership. Why do you partner with other organizations? So the Center for Creative Leadership for me is a really important partnership for two, well, two of many reasons. But the two I'll mention are the first one is when I was an associate at Mars, CCL, it's also known as, um, was integral, integral for me in my own leadership journey. So I went through a number of signature programs with them. And really, that has become embedded in my leadership style in research based, um, you know, performance and leadership. So I really enjoyed and was kind of the uh, I would call it some of the um, outcome of their programs really mm -hmm. helped shape my leadership style and help fine tune it. So one, I believe in it because I have been part of it and I've done it myself. You did and it. And I think the second part is, yeah. And then the second part of that is when you're a consultant, you know, you're paying a lot for me, um, which is to help guide you. Right. So you're usually looking for someone to have, you know, um, you know, you, you have something that clicks. And so, you know, that yes. works well. But in addition to that, you know, I am not a researcher per se, but I am someone who believes in this program and can utilize the great tools that CCL has and that they do full time. That's what they're good at. So I take what I'm good at, I take what they're good at, and we marry them together. And yeah. I think that creates the best product. And so that is also very helpful for companies because when you are working with myself in a program like CCL, CCL is something that will continue to get better and they refresh their materials and it's something you can continue to repeat in your organization. It's not just Susan's material off the shelf. It's actually CCL who's been around for 50 plus years. I see your point. <laughs> so now... How can someone that decided they wanted to work with your uh, company, how does that process work? Yeah, it's pretty simple. So you can go to our website, which is peoplerisellc.com. We have a contacts page. You can fill it out. We'll get back to you pretty quickly. Um, you can also go to my website and click on schedule consultation, and it'll take you to my um, Calendly page. And you can set up either a consultation or a coffee chat. And we can get to talking and hear a little bit more about your needs. What are you interested in? And, you know, have a conversation around that, what, whether or not that would be a fit to work together. Is the consultation free? Yes, it is. Oh, I was going to say, I'll take it. <laughs> so now, <laughs> well, you know where to find it now. You know where to find it. <laughs> That's for sure. So, you know, you, you have been involved in so many different things, and one of them is promoting mental health and well-being in the workplace. So why yeah. do you believe this is such a critical aspect of organization success, and what step can leaders take uh, to become more, to create a more creative, supportive environment for the staff? Oh, that's a wonderful question. So... And there's a number of reasons that I feel really passionate about mental health and well-being in the workforce. And the first one is, I will tell you, I have been someone who, not unlike many HR professionals and or not like many others, not unlike many others, um, who have struggled with mental health in the workplace. And 
in particular, if you have a lot of, um, I'll say them personal factors, whether that's, you know, responsibilities at home, that could be anything from um, managing or helping an aging parent, whether or not that means that you might have two people in the household or more to help with your um, child raising, or, you know, there's so many other factors and things that people are dealing with today. And I have been someone who struggled to be everything to everyone and do it well. I, you know, we kind of all get to a place where sometimes we just can't do it all and it all falls apart. And, you know, I'm really open about sharing that that's occurred to me because I think we also are on this journey in our society to be more open about mental health. I think we've already come a long way and I think that's important. But also it's around how we lead and manage our teams and our people that work for us in our, in, our, in our organizations. People look at you as a leader. They look at how you show up. They look at what you mm-hmm. value. And if you do that for yourself and you're willing to share, I find that people are very open with you. So my personal experience taught me a lot about what that looks like um, and how I had hoped that others would have asked me or been more um, you know, I'll call it forthcoming to, to ask me, how am I? How are you really? Oh, wow. um, and I think people are afraid of that. And so I think we need to, one, we need to work and be better at it. And secondly, the, the numbers are clear. Like the numbers around how much it costs employers when their associates, their employees are not mentally well, when they struggle with their well-being, those numbers are critical because those are lost productivity. People take leave, people are unable to be at their best, and their best creativity doesn't happen. Nobody wins in that situation. So I think in a practical matter, businesses need to care about mental health and well-being. I think you're seeing that. And it's more than just, oh, let's take some time off or go take a vacation. You know, people are very committed to their to their jobs, and we need to think differently about the time off. I think the four-week work schedule is getting a lot of um you know, just a lot of, um, you know, talk right now. I know in the uh, National Small Business Administration, I'm part of the conversation as well, talking about could we uh, or should we see four-day work weeks happen in our country? Uh, And we saw in the UK, it worked really well in their studies. So I think you're going to start to see, um, and we already are seeing employees say, you know what, we need to make this not just about what the employer wants, we need to balance it more with what makes employees at their best. And that's going to mean a focus on employee wellness. And that's going to include different leave policies. And it's going to include um, different and alternative ways to get work done. I agree with you on that. And also that um, there's a post that I was reading on LinkedIn actually yesterday. And the guy was saying that it's not just about the company, but it's also about the people that works within the company. Uh, mm. You should care about the person, the well-being. Are they okay today? Are they having any issues? What can you do to make the work a lot better? But also the other thing that he said that's really catch my attention is that um, when you leave this place or when you get fired, they forgot about you. They replace you. Mm. But at home, your family, the friends, the, the people that cares about you stay with you. So at the end of the day, you should also consider that too when you're making decisions when it comes to work, also about your well-being. Who cares about you? Who will be there for you when the time that you can't stand anymore? Is your job going to be there? Or is the neighbor that come knock on your door every day and say, hey, are you okay? Going to be there for you. Which one? So it was a very kind of interesting thing to read on, uh, on LinkedIn and, uh, and talking to you about it. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And as I mentioned, you know, I was that person who put work, you know, many oftentimes first one, because I loved it. You know, I think that's one thing that's important. I have this view that anything that's going to take me away from my family should be worth it. And so when I'm traveling or when I was out doing something, you know, for my business, I did it wholeheartedly because I was, I was in it. I was in it to win it. I was in it because it made me feel like I was at my best, but that's also where that kind of um, crossroads can happen, where sometimes it can get to be too much. And, you know, that happened to me too. I was working on vacations and all of that. And I learned the hard way, Um, you know, that a lot of times your family, you know, they chose you and you're not around. And, Uh you know, that's, that's, that's hard. You have to really, uh, before it's too late, really kind of see, Hey, what am I doing here? And am I getting, um, 
you know, the right things for me to be successful, both personally and professionally at the same time. But now as a seasoned executive coach, what advice do you have for senior leaders in navigating challenges and driving uh, success in today's, uh, God knows, it's so fast, right? <laughs> Business landscaping. Yeah, so some advice I would give senior leaders today, I think the first one is that we need to rethink the workforce and the workplace and what we are, how we're going to do work in the future. So the future of work is here. And so I think I've been reading as well a lot about, you know, this whole piece around coming back to the workplace. So we're hearing, you know, there's a lot of buildings that are empty and that employers must want us to come back because they're empty. Um, or, you know, they prefer that. And some of our uh, more senior leaders may have grown up, I'll call it, in an environment where presence equaled, you know, promotion. And really where I think we are now is we need to rethink that and we need to think about purpose versus presence. So one of the things that I worked on when I was at Mars was exactly this. We said there, hey, look, when you're in person, you want to be doing work that is going to be best in that kind of mm -hmm. um, environment, right? Where we're brainstorming, when we're thinking collaboratively at being in person is going to have maximum value. And you're also going to want to leave time for kind of the uninterrupted or, you know, the interruptions actually, right? So it's you coming up to my desk or me seeing you get grabbing a coffee and talking and catching up. A lot of really great conversation happens there. Coming to the office and doing Zoom calls benefits no one, in my opinion. Right? Just, well, you know, you're wasting your time, right? So when we're in the office, we need to make sure we are getting really good work done and we're making sure that we maximize that. So my first advice for senior leaders is rethink some of your old ways of working. Think about where your people are going to be at their best because ultimately when people are at their best, they're going to give you 10 times more than, you know, than just what you're seeing on the surface. That's always the case. And then the second piece of advice right now is going to be being an example. So your people are going to watch how you behave. They're going to watch how you travel. They're going to watch how you, what, how many hours you work. They're going to watch when you take vacation. Are you emailing when you're on vacation or are you actually taking the time for yourself? Because mm -hmm. you create, you know, a uh, precedent almost, right? People are watching that. So I would say, remember, you have a shadow that's bigger than you think. So make sure that you are being the leader that you would want others to emulate. So those are the first two things. I think the final third thing is I would encourage us to make sure that when we're having time or if you're not doing it already, you're encouraging some very specific time with your folks, with your people, where you're talking about how are they doing and what do they need for themselves to continue to learn, to grow and be at their best. So sometimes we need to have those conversations where we're not just talking about work, like what are you, what do you still have on your plate or how long do you get that deadline done, but actually saying, hey, what's getting in the way for you to be at your best? Do you have all the resources do you need? Do you need any help on this one project? Are you short staffed or how can we think of this differently? So I think the third piece of advice is make sure you schedule some time or create some time where you know, you go for a walking meeting or you meet in person in the office or something, mm -hmm. but make some time where that person feels like you're invested in their success. And it's not just about, you know, the work getting done, the work's going to get done, but that person's at their best and they feel like you care about them. You know, again, the win is going to happen for both of you. But also, you know, um, on, on other platform, you have discussed um, the skills of the future. So what are some of the essential uh, skills that leaders and professionals should develop to actually succeed in today's, uh, in, in, bus in, in the business landscape, like in the job in general? Mm -hmm. I think that we touched on it already. I think one of the skills of the future is going to be uh, listening to understand. Listening. So listening, to, yeah, listening to understand. So listening to understand what the other person is saying doesn't mean you agree with them. It means that you're listening to understand their point of view, right? So you're going to want to be curious. You're going to want to ask good questions. You're going to want to understand more about where that person is coming from. Um, and that's where I think, of course, you know, this idea of, you know, diverse opinions. We want to have people who have different ideas. You know, we're not going to be innovative cultures and get to the future if we're going to have, you know, the same kind of way to solve problems. That's not the case. 
So you need to create space where you are listening to understand. And my favorite thing to tell senior leaders is to stay quiet. So Mm. something like the 80-20 rule, right? So you're staying quiet and you're only talking 20% of the time and you're listening 80% of the time. Let that other person talk for 80% of the time. So I would say, you know, listening to understand with the 80-20 rule is going to be important. And, you know, people want to be heard. This is a time, especially, again, I keep going back to coming out of COVID, people have felt, you know, very insulated. People have felt very alone. This is real. And people are still feeling the effects of that. So we still have some work to do. And I think the way that we can continue to strengthen our workforces, create retention, maximizing employee potential is going to be by listening to understand and, and listening more and talking less. And, and, and you're right with that, too. And I, I met a lot of people, uh, a lot of time. They talk so much. I don't even have any chance to even say hi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, doing a lot of talking in this, in, this, uh, in this talk, but, you know, you're asking me the questions in this setting. Well, is that, this one is natural. It's about you. We're talking about you here. You are in the yeah. front line. It's like, this is all about you. But when it comes to in the workplace, uh, you are managing other people. If you don't listen to them how can you manage them because you I, for me uh, studying psychology one thing i learned is that every human mm. is different we all are different in every single way you can think of the way we think the way we act even when we agree with certain things we still think about it in a different way we still agree with it in a different way of looking at it so if yeah. you don't get to know a human being then you're not going to be able to work with that person very well I agree. And I think most importantly, the human connection, you know, really suffered. And, you know, we're trying to find our way, everybody. I think everyone is trying to find their way. Again, employers are, people are, there's no one size fits all. And again, I encourage people to ask, you know, what's going to make a difference or what's going to make something more positive. Or if you have a challenge or a problem, you can't get unstuck. Well, how are we going to fix that? How are we going to do that differently? Or who are we going to talk to? Or talk to somebody who's not even in that project or problem. And so I think that's, again, where we need to employ different types of thinking and approaches because, you know, we can't, it's kind of like the book, you know, what got you here isn't going to get you there, right? So we have to keep thinking differently about how we go about the business. And I think that, you know, we're seeing five generations in the workforce right now, and that's causing conflict. And we need to be aware of it. But when we don't listen and we shut different groups down or we make assumptions and stereotypes and we all have bias, but we need to be aware of those things because if we don't, it will just continue to be part of the problem, not the solution. But you know, one thing also, Susan, I always said that you don't need to uh, agree with the, what the person is doing. Uh, you don't need to be a part of it. You don't actually need to even uh, knowledge the fact that they are who they are. But the thing is that is to be able to understand where they're coming from and then make yeah. sure you create space for them to be comfortable on their own yeah. skin. And that's how I see it. It's when people are talking about different type of group when it's come to gender. Um, mm-hmm. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to agree with all of them because I was born to understand two genders. When you talk about anything else, it's just out of my out of my space. But at the same time, I have to understand that this person chose to be who they want to be. And that's their life. And I have to create space when they're around me to be OK, to feel OK. I don't need to be in their business, but I need to make them feel welcome. And I think that's how I think every organization should look at it. You need to welcome everyone. Like even the cat watches, you have that sleeping under the chair. You need, <laughs> you need to make everything, everyone, what, whoever they are, welcome to your space. And uh, when they leave, they leave okay. They are okay. They feel they were welcome and they leave feeling the same way. And that's how I see that every organization, of every organization should look at it. Yeah, you know, it's also interesting about what you're saying is that I've also been seeing alarmingly a lot of um, programs around diversity, inclusion, um, equity, accessibility, you know, all these programs that there was this 
you know, you started to see this increase in focus on, you know, let's, let's, let's talk about building inclusive workforces. Let's talk yes. about, well, like you said, like, what does that look like? It's a journey. You know, this is something that is going to be something we need to spend some time and focus on and it needs attention. And because everybody brings their whole selves to work and what happens in the, in the external environment um, impacts everyone that works. For yes. You. Like it, it's, it's, you can't cut it out. And unfortunately I keep seeing and reading so many people have been let go in this space or they've started these efforts and they committed all this money and attention and now it's out the window and mm -hmm. this is alarming. And I think that's another part where it's up to us to continue to demand and expect that these things are being done in workplaces. And I'm watching, I'm watching and uh, you know, all the time, um, you know, what's going on in those businesses. And again, it's kind of like people rise, you know, if you're not wanting to be better than you are today, if you're not looking to improve, um, you know, that's, that's probably not going to be a fit for us because if yeah. we're going to employ the same way and the same way of doing things, you know, that's not where I want to be at. And that's not going to exactly. be the future. And so I think that's something that um, companies really need to take stock of. And, you know, yeah. we've seen a lot of them who have not and what it, what its impact. Exactly. And I think when you talk about that, they spending uh, a lot of money into it and nothing happened after that. And I think the reason that is the fact that they're trying to show in the front end that they are doing things to welcome anyone. But really in the back end, they're not really into that, really. So it's oh, kind yeah. of sad to see it happening. But for me, the, the way I see it, like you don't need to be OK with that person. Choice of life. But you just need to create a space for them to be okay with their own life in your space. And I think that's all that's matter. You can stay with your belief, whatever you believe in. For example, being a black woman, when I walk in a womb, not everybody will like the fact that I'm a color girl. It's okay with me if you don't like it. Just welcome me and make me feel welcome and listen to what I have to say. And I'm okay with that. And I think that every organization should do the exact same thing. You need to create space for everyone, for women, for whatever gender they choose to be. You need to create that space and welcome them to your space and keep your attitude to yourself. You know, when you go home, you can just go in the shower and scream at yourself, which is okay by everyone else because no one is watching you. <laughs> yeah, well, and you know, that I think is an important thing in the sense of companies and moving changing company culture takes time, right? It can really, it can take time, right? It's kind of like sometimes can feel very long and hard because it's, it's a culture, but every day, each of us can make a choice on how we show up, what we do, how we create environments where people can feel included. Um, and that that's what we can all, we can all impact on a daily basis. Each one of us can do that. And also that is all you do within your company as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I agree. So is there anything else you'd like to share with us before I let you go today? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think the only other thing I might want to share, you know, is just that um, I think at People Rise, you know, as I had shared before, we're really wanting to help, you know, small and medium sized businesses with their HR challenges and think of us as those that can really help you with your business challenges, you know, the people that you have today, you hired them for a reason, and you're going to need to continue to invest in them. We're going to, you know, we want to continue to work on the skills gap. We want to continue to invest in our people. They will always give it back to you. I have mentioned that a couple of times. So my parting words and advice is just remember that, you know, those people that work for you, they're there because they want to do their best. Help enable that as well with what you put into them. And if you don't have any help, just get the help from, from a company like people rise. Um, that's what they do. And the good thing about it, she has over 22 years of experience to shake you up a little bit. <laughs> she sees it all. I've seen, I've seen a lot of different things in my time, a lot of different things. There's always something new, but you know, um, bottom line, we'll figure it out together. So absolutely. So Great. Thank you so much, Susan. I appreciate you taking the, the time to talk to me and to share your knowledge with me, not just with me, but also with the, our audience as well. So I appreciate your time and what you are doing. So every time that we have a woman step into the business world, trust me, 
we are making an impact and then we are telling the next generation we are getting there and you need to continue that route as well. So I thank you for what you are doing. Thank you. That really means a lot. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Female Founders Podcast. That's it for this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on your favorite podcast app or connect with us on warmail.com so that you don't miss our next episode. See you next time. Bye for now.